All right. Well, I want to welcome you. Good morning. Thank you for taking the time on your Friday morning to join us for the Eastern Tennis Conference and this session. Um, hopefully you've been participating in our week-long Eastern Tennis Conference and been enjoying those sessions. Today is actually a very special day. Not only is it Friday and we're going to talk about funding, but it is our executive director's birthday. So shout out to Jenny Schnitzer. Happy birthday, cheers to you. Thank you for your leadership. Great to be a part of this team. Um, in doing that and having fun today, we are gonna talk about grants. Um, so I wanted you guys to really get out of this session a few things. And that is, uh, we're gonna talk about the Eastern Grant availability um, we're going to talk about the eligibility, we're going to talk about where you can find the grants, and we're going to talk about best practices and tips about having to write grants. So we're going to get into the nitty gritty, um, and that would be a great opportunity for you guys to take notes. Um, in housekeeping, in the housekeeping um, time of this uh, session, we wanted to just point out that you do have the chat feature or the Q&A feature to put in your questions and we'll definitely get to them towards the end of the session. Um, I also wanna call out uh, because we're kind of winding down in our Eastern Tennis Conference, we do have a few other sessions today. So you can check them out. One's at noon, um, that one's nurturing a tennis community during COVID. At 5 p.m. there's Team USA with Kathy Rinaldi. And then at 6.15, we have our fun award ceremony. So please do check us out. Um, I do want to also introduce our panel. We have some great guest speakers today. And a part of the session is to find out from them their experiences as providers in our Eastern section and grant writers. So today we have Valerie Rifkin, who's the vice president of Tennis for All. Um, she, that is a nonprofit, a community tennis association based out of Long Island at the Carefree Racket Club, and it's a family owned business. Um, she also has a day job, which is an environmental consultant. Um, so that's great to have you here, Valerie. Dennis is here as well, and he is a, I think, English teacher, Dennis, right, for 17 years in the Newburgh area. So thank you so much for the students. And you're also a coach, a varsity tennis coach. And then the other hat that you wear is for your Newburgh, um, and I think you changed the name most recently, so it's throwing me off, but Newburgh Junior Tennis and Learning Champions, which is a nonprofit in NJTL and CTA as well. So thank you, Dennis. And who's moderating the fun panel that we have today is Danielle Pulliam. So she's our, uh, she's also a member of the board, has been on the board. I know that you're incoming as our diversity and inclusion chair. So that's exciting. Thank you for all you do at Eastern. And during the day, she's a program officer at the Pinkerton Foundation where she runs grants. She's a grant manager. So welcome to our guests. Thank you for being here. We'll bring them back um, at the midway point of our session so that you can hear their experiences. So hang tight and you'll get to uh, hear all the good things that they have to say later on. Now for the fun stuff, we're gonna go over what grants are available and the eligibility of those grants. Um, so for the moment, we are excited to put together the Growing Tennis Together application that is launched as of this morning. So you can actually apply for grants in this bucket. Um, we want to have this grant be proposals which target youth initiatives, um, as well as, as you see, Tennis in the Parks and other program support, such as programs in junior team tennis, or intro to play programs. Uh, USTA is launching a new program called Tennis 101. Um, and then we also don't want to, to forget any adult leagues and initiatives that you may be thinking about to host at your parks or facilities um, or any partnerships that relate to that. 
Lastly, there are our community tennis providers that are CTAs and NJTLs, and they are also eligible to apply. So we want to try to have this support for a wide range for a tennis ecosystem to survive in this difficult time um, and then help grow the sport. As far as requirements go, we want to really have these programs as it pertains to these grants and your proposal, which is number one, to make sure that the applicant as well as the coaches who you're listing in your program proposal are safe play approved. Uh, the next requirement for this grant proposal is also a USTA membership. Um, so those are the key things. With this grant, we always want to look at, at Eastern and the reviewers, the measurable outcomes. So in any of those program areas, we're looking for the growth of participation and what those measurable outcomes can be. Um, so the key is that it is open as of today to apply, and we do have a deadline of March 19th. We also wanna support our schools. We know that during this time as well, our schools have been impacted severely where the students are not getting physical activity and a lot of our school partnerships are on pause or they've started and then on pause again. So we really wanna make this grant um, almost flexible, if you will. Uh, there had been some stricter eligibility requirements in the past years, but as a result of these trying times, we do want to make it a bit easier for our schools to get up and running with tennis programs. This is our, our, youth, uh, our school youth tennis initiative grant, which is available as of today as well. The deadline is the 15th. We're looking for a school or an organization that can either partner or support schools in the after school space. Um, and again, we do know that we're in a difficult time. So some schools aren't allowing partners to enter the school, which we're aware of, but we do know that there has been some opportunities in the outdoor season or the outdoor time to actually have school programs happening. So, we are flexible on that. We want to really support the schools. So please touch base with us for knowing what programs and ideas and connections you have made that may be great and um, eligible for this grant. The same thing applies as term, in terms of the previous grant, the Growing Tennis Together grant, by which we are requiring Safe Play and a USTA member organization a current member organization. Other grants that I want to highlight that could be available, we do have our USDA Eastern partners uh, that uh, support our programs as well. We do have in the Eastern section, the Junior Tennis Foundation, M Mark McIntyre, who's the executive director, uh, had a session this week and he supports programs throughout our section uh, applications aren't accessible at the moment, but I did want to do a call out that they are a part of our support system as far as grants are concerned. Um, and then a next call out to USTA Foundation. They also offer program grants specifically uh, through the NJTL or the National Junior Tennis and Learning Network. And they have a separate website if you are, are an NJTL, you can go ahead and take a look at what grants are available through the USTA Foundation. And I wanted to point out too that they do support um, uh, players that are excelling um, and there is a requirement there that you'll see on their website as well. The next thing I wanted to point out was our USTA Eastern Diversity and Inclusion Grants. This is also open as of today. And then the deadline, as you can see, is December 9th, 2021. Um, this one is a new grant that um, is managed by David Williams, who's our diversity and inclusion manager. 
And this one is pertaining to those organizations committing to attracting to and engaging with tennis players throughout various educational projects um, and then tying in those uh, observations of holidays or um, dates. I know that in February we're um, approaching Black History Month, so things of that nature. And then secondly, there is also a grant for our adaptive and wheelchair tennis programs. This grant is available um, to those programs and the one requirement here listed is uh, to have them registered uh, with our registry for the USTA Adaptive Tennis. And there will be a link that you go to for any programs that are adaptive in wheelchair and they can uh, just register online for that. I've put David Williams's contact in the presentation. So if you have any questions further about this grant, you can certainly reach out. Now, after I've gone through all of what our grants are within our Eastern and USTA infrastructure, I wanted to point out to you guys that there is an opportunity for other resources. Uh, Donors Choose is an organization.org, I should say donorschoose.org, is an organization that helps teachers in the public and charter school systems. Um, I've connected with them, and this is an interesting uh, opportunity for those on the call that are teachers or work with teachers. Um, this is the, the time of crowdsourcing and crowdfunding. Um, so those of you that want to explore this, I wanted to just point it out. Uh, this is something that you can look into and just click on that website to find out what the eligibility are. And with that said, I think what's interesting is, is that uh, even though we're fortunate at Eastern to offer those grants listed um, and discussed prior, that you as grant um, seekers may want to look at other opportunities by which grants are available as well. And um, that is one that I wanted to point out since here at Eastern uh, Schools Tennis is a, is a priority. So I've gone over what our grants are in terms of availability, uh, some eligibility and requirements to those grants. Uh, there are additional uh, requirements that you'll notice when you do look at the applications at your uh, convenience. But at this time, I wanted to just call out what's important as grant writers and seekers uh, when writing the grant. I wanted to, and this may seem redundant or remedial, if you will, uh, that we would try to provide a best practice to say, follow the specifications of what the grant is asking for. And when you're sitting down and writing a grant, try to think of how to capture the reviewer's attention. So if the Growing Tennis Together grant was looking for a grant that would pertain to programmings with measurable income, uh, outcomes, what would you sit and write down? Um, so it helps to take notes, um, maybe jot down some ideas before you start typing away and then focus on the key narrative topics. So take a look at those grant applications, sit through them, see which one you're eligible for to apply, and then just put those topics together before submitting and do a lot of editing. The next key to the grants and grant writing and what our reviewers are looking for is really a clear and defined budget. So we're looking for something that's formatted correctly. We have in the past received grants that might have been just a number and that does not hold well in terms of it being reviewed because it's very difficult to understand what you're using the funding for. So develop the budget with a strategy in mind for what your program will be. List those costs line by line, that would be helpful for the reviewers to understand what it is that you're looking to use the grant for. And then 
revenue. There are many programs that charge a small fee um, or whatever fee there is. Put that in if that is applicable, because we do want to see that. In the grant narrative, you may have wrote, someone may have written, there is a fee and then it's not reflected in the budget. That does not mirror what your proposal is. So as some best practice and advice, make sure that it aligns with your actual narrative proposal and then put it in your spreadsheet. Lastly is check your map. If you are using a spreadsheet, you can actually set the fields in an Excel spreadsheet to aggregate or sum the total for you. Um, with that said, I think even though this may sound repetitive or you've seen it before, create a spreadsheet that makes sense. This is a template. Um, after this presentation, we can definitely make sure that you can have access to this particular template is really simple. Uh, the top fields, as you can see, shows the revenue of this program. If there's money coming in through foundations, government or corporations, but most of the grants that come in are either from contributions um, or revenue from player, player fees. So I've used that as an example in this case. And the other thing is for the expenses, specify exactly what it is. You can create a uh, column to put notes about what those um, items would be. And then you can specify exactly what that is in a spreadsheet. And again, this would mirror what your narrative in the actual proposal uh, would look like. So I know this is uh, sort of, uh, dry and, and nitty gritty stuff of grants, but I do wanna make that call out as a simple reminder. Um, now that you've actually gotten a chance to get familiar with two simple tips, trying to um, have that narrative ready, putting some notes together, pinpointing what your budget's for, now you're sitting down and you're like, now what? Where do I actually go and apply? So we do have a grant portal that we use at Eastern for the Eastern specific grants. So it would be Growing Tennis Together, the schools grant, and the DNI grants would be found in this portal. Um, we, you can find it on usta.com, but so it's on our website, and then you can access that. You would need to create a new account if you haven't applied through our Eastern grants in the past three years. Um, if you hadn't applied uh, in these past three years, you would need to create a new account, which is really easy. You see it on the screen. You just click on create new account and then plug in your information. So that's the technical side of it. Um, wrapping up uh, with all of this technical stuff, I wanted to make sure that you knew that it is important for us to guide you through the process. There's a few grants that um, our team can help you uh, learn about what those are, what it's for, kind of get feedback from our team. So uh, utilize us in wanting to find out more information, clarification, support in your efforts to writing these grants. Um, now that I've gone through the boring and dry stuff, I wanna bring in our panelists and um, have them uh, share their knowledge and uh, experience from the programs that they run. So I'm going to kick it back to Danielle. Thank you. Um, Jocelyn, that was wonderful information that you shared with everyone. So I wanna bring in um, Valerie and Dennis. Um, they're gonna kind of talk about their, their organizations and programs and, and highlight the grants that they've gotten. But before they get into the grant details, it'd be wonderful if Valerie could talk about your Tennis for All program and Dennis, you can talk about the Newburgh Junior Tennis and Learning Program. So Valerie, why don't you go first and kind of give a little bit of background around your role and the program and who you serve, just, just so our audience can know a little bit more about the type of work you do. Sure. Uh, thank you, Jocelyn and Danielle, for having me here. 
uh, first of all. So I'm vice president of Tennis for All. We're a CTA based out of Carefree Racquet Club in Long Island. And uh, we started the program to, we started the, the Tennis for All actually, so we could um, make a after school, school-based program. That was like our first idea to do. And also to see how we could help the community, which is uh, basically underserved a lot of the parts of the community. Um, so we started doing charitable clinics and raising money for different um, charities such as American Heart Association, American Cancer Society, Crohn's and Colitis. Um, there's a community cupboard which we um, have uh, coat drives for and we ask uh, people to come and bring non-perishable items which we donate to. <clears throat> and all for this charitable um, cause is, is, is basically where Tennis for All was born. So um, we had to get a little more creative so we are, so oh, there we go. So there are some of the, uh, some of the events that we've held. Um, and we have uh, actually worked with different partners and with the USDA in securing grants in order to make these programs happen. Great. Oh, Dennis, do you wanna go now? Sure. I was. I wasn't sure if. Uh, I wasn't sure you were done, Valerie. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I could talk all day, so I just figured I'd stop. <laughs> Keep going, Valerie. No, it's. Uh, I was. I was listening. It's awesome. Um, so thank you guys again for for having me. Happy birthday, Jenny. Um, yeah, I've, I'm an English teacher. You know, I uh, my first love was basketball. Uh, I played tennis as a junior for the first time uh, in high school when I was younger, and I loved it. But if you had told me when I was a junior in high school that I would be involved uh, in tennis to this extent, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I, I would have believed you. Um, but it's just the way my career kind of, uh, kind of took place. And uh, I had an opportunity to coach the varsity team in Newburgh uh, 10 years ago now. And um, when, I, when I started as the coach, I recognized there was no instructional program uh, and so I, I wanted to address that. I wanted to build a program. So we started a booster club, uh, which uh, really grew and, and kids in the program bought into what we were trying to do. Um, and we partnered with Mid-Hudson Valley Tennis. Um, and, you know, in the last three years, really, we've, this is our third year as an NJTL, as a two-star NJTL. So we've come a long way. Um, the community that I, that I serve is, is, is a community that's really struggling. Uh, like a lot of uh, inner city communities right now, um, it's, it's a district that's over 11,000 students. Um, we, we are, we're called the crossroads of the Northeast. Uh, it's really a beautiful area, but it's going through some hard times right now. So, um, and, and this has been going on, you know, prior to COVID, of course, we've, we've serviced a lot of kids and, and uh, adults in the community who, uh, who've never, you know, had an opportunity to play tennis. So um, a few years ago, when we decided to become an NJTL, um, you know, we formed these great partnerships with the Newburgh School District, the district that I work in, um, along with the Valley Central School District, which is a neighboring school district. And um, we've been able to introduce tennis to hundreds and hundreds of kids during that time. Um, so it's, it's really amazing, you know, where we started as a booster club and what the intention was at the time, which was really to build a, a program, which is now really uh, morphed into this, this giant beast, uh, which I, I don't know if I can contain it. <laughs> but it's a good thing, and I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Valerie. So I think um, I know we have some questions in the chat, but before we get to those questions as the moderator, I'll take moderator privilege and ask you guys a few questions just to talk about you're the grant seekers for your organization. So really to help our audience understand what types of what are your funding priorities and what types of grants have you received from from USTA and just kind of walk our audience through that process. So Whoever wants start? to go first. So uh, for Tennis for All, um, our biggest priority actually is uh, paying the pros. 
So we do have partners. We work with Carefree. Carefree does donate a lot of the court time when possible. Um, and the pros actually do also donate their um, fees as well. Um, but we can't just ask them to work every program without getting paid. I mean, it's their livelihoods. Um, no matter how worthy the cause is, we need to pay the pros. So that's like our basic number one uh, priority for funding. Um, court time as well, like I said, Carefree does donate court time when they can, but that's the second priority. What about you, Dennis? Yeah, um, for us, it's our number one priority is uh, the school grants, to be honest, it's, uh, it's so influential to the growth of our program. We, we do not have our own facility. So uh, we have partnerships with um, Sportsplex in New Windsor, which is a local tennis club, uh, now Matchpoint in Goshen. Um, and, you know, without those partnerships, we wouldn't be able to uh, bring our kids and sustain programming. Uh, but we wouldn't have kids if it weren't for the school's program. Uh, certainly being a teacher helps. I think being a teacher in the district, I, I know most of the phys ed teachers. Um, I've, I, you know, recruited many of them to, to initiate these programs. Um, but that's where we get rackets in kids' hands for the first time. And that's where we, we generate that interest. And, and then from there, we can, um, you know, transition into the pathway that we've set forth. So I would say that's number one. Obviously, staff fees, um, court time. Again, since we're, we're we're partnering with so many different places, um, equipment. Um, but it, it really begins with with getting into the schools, and and that's kind of an obstacle right now. Obviously, as Jocelyn alluded to a little bit, but we're we're trying our best. Yeah. So it sounds like a lot of the same court time facilities, equipment. They're real tangible things that you, uh, staff paying for pros you're asking for funding for concrete and specific things that are measurable. And I think that that's helpful. Um, let's talk about some, where else have you been able to find some of the, the funding? Um, because that was something that Jocelyn raised at the end of her presentation. Maybe you guys can just share some examples. Okay, go so- first, Dennis? Oh, <laughs> just mixing it up this time. <laughs> sure, yeah, um, we've, We've had these annual play days, which have been fun events for our program and the community um, where we bring, you know, we bring people and anyone's able to come and uh, we, we basically take over the local club and, um, you know, we just have a great fun event. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to reach out to local businesses, for, uh, to ask for sponsors um, and, Prior to COVID, we had our most successful play day, raising almost $10,000. It was a great event, um, and we'd like to repeat that, although, we, again, we're, we're running into some obstacles. But that, that, was, uh, that, was, our, that was our model, really. Uh, and we had not only uh, an opportunity to connect with community members, but we were bringing in people who hadn't played tennis in a while, who had learned about what we were doing, and they wanted to make contributions to the program. Um, so again, in the age of COVID, we're, we're trying to find creative ways to, um, uh, recoup some of that. Um, but prior to COVID that, that was our, that was our model. And, and, uh, you brought in, that's great that you start, started talking about COVID. So I know, um, Valerie, maybe you can also frame it around like what, where you were with COVID in terms of pre-COVID programming and what it looks like now, how has COVID impacted your, pro your programming and fundraising? Okay, so pre-COVID, we basically focused on our um, school-based after-school program in the Belmore Merrick community at an ele elementary school, which was wildly successful when, once we got it off the ground, and we were about to expand to a second school until COVID hit, so that put the kibosh on all of that. Um, now, we basically are starting some exciting new programs in the time of COVID. Um, one of them is we're focusing on the beginner tennis players who only started playing during the pandemic because tennis has been touted as a safe sport. Um, hundreds and thousands of people flocked to the parks and to the outdoor courts and started learning tennis. So we're trying to form a new niche um, of these players and start um, safe 
beginning, you know, safe lessons and play for these beginning players in a safe environment, regardless of the weather, indoors and outdoors. So we're bringing them indoors. And um, we've been having some success with that. Uh, also, another thing that we're focusing on is the, the junior team tennis players. A lot of families do not want their kids playing at other courts because of the pandemic, but they do feel comfortable having their kids at their own home court. So we're doing a series of in-house challengers with these junior team tennis kids and you know, the young kids so they can still keep their competitive edge, still keep playing um, you know, until this pandemic is over and they will, again, you know, branch out again into inter, uh, team leagues. That's great, making the situation work, you know, making the best Try. of the situation. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. So are there some of the things that, th some things that you're seeing now that you're doing that you will continue past, past COVID, like some new things that you just started, like this in, um, in-house tennis that you just started, are you challengers? Talk about, are there any things that you're gonna continue that you think, hey, this is working, we might do this past, past once we get out of this COVID pandemic situation? Yeah, yeah, I mean, especially with the new players that just started playing in the pandemic, um, we're gonna try and, and keep them for life and actually like move them along the pathway into leagues and, and and other, you know, different, you know, once the pandemic is over back, you know, into leagues. So, so yeah, I mean, hopefully they will just catch the bug, which a lot of them have, we've noticed, and we'll just continue to want to play. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's been a full transition for us. And we kind of discussed this when we met uh, a while back about, you know, the, the debate between quality versus quantity. And, and for us, like we had to pivot and really just focus on quality instruction in small cohorts. So that's been our real, our, our main focus right now. And as you can see in some of the pictures here, uh, one of the things that we've pivoted on is um, a new programming. So what is something that, again, like Valerie mentioned that we can do uh, that's safe and, and so uh, we've, we've uh, formed another great partnership with Faz Ali, who I believe is on the call. Hope you're on the call, Faz. Um, and this is, uh, these are some photos from our, our recent wheelchair tennis event over at Match Point in Goshen. Um, so smaller cohorts has really been our main focus in, in improving instruction and bringing in volunteers and uh, improving our instruction has really been the main focus. Uh, so I would say that's, that's something that's not going anywhere. <laughs> you know, once, once uh, instruction improves, uh, then we can, again, when we're able to ramp up the, the quantity some more, I think that's only going to improve our, our program and grow our program even more. And we're opening it up to questions. Um, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A um, chat um, and I'm encouraging others now is the time to kind of type your questions in. So we do have a question from Herbert. How, do, how does the club fight help you financially and do they charge um, for the use of the club? Oh, I'll take that. So with Carefree, um, Carefree does donate the court time as much as possible. Um, there are times when we can't, but as much as possible, they can, they do. And if we can get some reimbursement from the grants, that was an extra bonus. And then Michelle has a question. Will the USDA be advertising sites for Tennis 101 with a detailed schedule of um, days and night programs that can be searchable? I guess this is a, a Jocelyn question. Hi, yeah, thanks Michelle for that question. Um, Tennis 101 is a new program for youth and adult. Uh, not so new in the concept because it is about intro to tennis programs. But as far as uh, advertising, Eastern uh, has a dedicated web page or web, yes, web page for um, a pilot we did uh, in 2020 at the end of 2020. So we'll continue to strive to make sure that we can do what we can to market and promote on our USTA channels. Great. Dawson, there was another question around adaptive grants, applying for adaptive grants. I don't think you mentioned that in your, at the end when you were talking about the different categories. How does- Let me open that up. Do you have the question handy? Some, I don't think I'm seeing it on my screen. Oh yeah, no, I'm just asking you the question. 
Oh, you're asking. I thought you were like referring to the <laughs> chat. We're just chatting away here, Danielle. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, the adaptive uh, grants are offered for wheelchair and adaptive tennis programs. Grant amount is up to $2,000. Uh, David Williams will be uh, managing those grants. And there also are grants for the observances of the calendar. So specific to uh, specific months and um, themes of those, of, those uh, of our year. So like I said, if, um, if you reach out to David, I think he'll go in depth with that. Uh, I do want to circle back since we did open it up about uh, some of those technical questions um, about the grant process or the eligibility is that uh, all grants uh, cannot, our grants at Eastern cannot fund registration fees um, and transportation or membership. So just bear that in mind. And that is for all our grants that go out. And then I also wanted to call out, we do work with our regions. So we have our sections uh, as Eastern for those grants that I've mentioned. And I do want to call out that we do have the region grants. So through our regional councils, there are some funding available that could support our uh, tennis ecosystem throughout the section. So I would recommend that uh, you connect with our team, the community tennis department, our tennis service representatives uh, to find out more information. And then you'll get connected to the council who is likely the regional council director uh, for uh, those grants. Great. Any other questions that are coming in the chat? Lots well, there's of another, I have another question. Um, <laughs> I'll yeah. ask a question while we wait for those questions to come in. Um, just, I think um, you guys started, Valerie and Dennis, you mentioned a little bit about some of the, the partnerships that you, you have in, in fundraising. Maybe you can expound on that a little bit more to kind of talk about what you're doing in your local areas. You know, what, what do the, these partnerships look like and how are you collaborating in the fundraising part of it. Okay, uh, yeah, so we do have several partners that we work with. Um, number one is, um, well, different charities, American Cancer Society, American Heart Association, Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, you name it, um, a bunch of them. Um, we work with a local food pantry, uh, having people um, donate in non-perishable items, which we, again, in turn, give to the local food pantry. We've held coat drives and for every coat that a person would donate, they would enter a raffle for an hour and a half of free court time at Carefree. Um, all, all different kinds of charities, you name it. Um, ju uh, Juvenile Diabetes Research uh, Foundation. Um, uh, basically just, we, we want to work with these partners in order to a, number one, help out the community that we live in and number two, to um, get more people to play tennis and having people help out really gets them excited as well to join the, play, the game. So. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, we, um, our, our community sponsors have been, have been tremendous um, in supporting, you know, our program goals, our initiatives, um, you know, receiving sponsors in kind. We have, again, we have a ton of, uh, of partnerships and relationships, and that that's really been the key to to our growth and, and getting our word out. Um, I will add that it is challenging as a, again as as a not for profit, um, as a limited staff of one, <laughs> it, it it can be you know it can be challenging to to promote um, and and maintain you know um, my my day job responsibilities, um, but. We've, we've been able to implement certain programs each year. And, and in, even in my high school program, um, we have an annual match that we play. It's our, it's our senior night match where, it, um, you know, again, we have guests come in, we have visitors come in and, and make donations. Uh, that money goes to the American Cancer Society. Um, my, the kids in my program are all volunteers uh, in in the uh, programs that we run for our red, orange, and green dot ball cohorts. So the volunteer hours that they are accruing uh, is something they can add to their resume 
And what I'm noticing in doing this over the last few years is that I have a lot of high school to now college age kids who still want to volunteer. They still are involved in tennis. So it is introducing another problem, uh, but something that I, I think we're going to be addressing this year. And it's that a lot of kids, and this is, this is true if you look at the data, a lot of kids when they're done playing high school tennis, they kind of fall off and, and they don't necessarily participate in USPTA. So we want to find ways to keep them in the game uh, and keep them playing. Um, so that's something that we're, we're kind of working on right now um, to keep our college kids engaged in USTA events um, and to keep them playing because they're still giving back. They're still donating. Uh, and so we want to recognize that. That's great. You, you both are really just getting great, great examples of the creativity that you use to, to, to bring resources into the organization and just being a limited, limited staff, you have to be. So it's kind of out of necessity, but it, it's, these are great examples. Um, we have a few more questions coming in. Um, I guess I'm just gonna, I think a, a few of these questions are directed to you, Jocelyn. So um, yeah. I'll just, I'll just go, I'm gonna read from the bottom. There was a $1,000 uh, $1, regional grant that the USDA Eastern had previously. Um, I was told you didn't have to go through the normal grant application process. Is that been put on hold because of COVID? Is it still available is, is the question. Thanks for that question. Um, so for this year in 2021, those smaller grants are really gonna come from the region. Uh, typically the region grants are up to $1,000. So um, that would be uh, the availability as far as those smaller grants are concerned. It has to go through the process. Um, so we have applications up as well for those region grants using our found in system through the grant portal. Um, and again, we could um, send you the direct link and walk you through that uh, going forward. Great. Um, there's a question, uh, maybe Dennis, you could take this. Are there requirements for junior players to register for programs supported by grants through ServeNet or Net um, Generation? I think Kristen wanted to answer that. There was another question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm having problems. Go back. <laughs> That's all right. I, I saw a question about um, how we reached out to the schools. I believe it was. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you can find it, then please. <laughs> There's a lot of things popping up on my screen right now. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, so the question was, uh, uh, sorry, how did you develop the relationship partnerships with your community schools? Um, again, being a, a teacher in the district, um, really helps. Uh, so knowing someone in the district is, is probably the first step. Um, my district, again, we're, we're a large um, inner city school district. Um, we have nine elementary schools in the district. So initiating, you know, before school or after school tennis programs in each of those districts required uh, reaching out, just me reaching out individually to the phys ed teachers that were assigned to those buildings. Uh, fortunately, I, I already had, as a coach in the district, I already had some relationships with many of the phys ed teachers. In some cases, it was just kind of cold calling and emailing them um, and, and bugging them, <laughs> explaining the benefits of the program and um, the equipment that they would be getting, um, the, the collaboration that they would be receiving in terms of the professional development with the tennis pro coming into the building. So, um, and that model, you know, has, has stayed true in, in, in Valley Central in our neighboring school district, which has uh, four elementary schools. Um, and we're doing the same thing now in, an, in another district, which we're branching into in, in Washingtonville, if that helps. Great. Um, I'm seeing questions in the chat and in the Q&A, so I'm not sure which one I should be focusing on. No so, worries. Danielle, I'll jump in on, on one that I saw pop up in the Q&A. Um, okay. Michelle asked, what is the benefits uh, of these Tennis 101 players that join USTA? Um, well, I'll, I'll take this question um, and, and say that from a perspective of what we're going to do at Eastern as far as Tennis 101 is concerned, is that we do wanna support it, uh, not just with the availability of these grants, but we've also 
uh, considered some value propositions, if you will, to use that term, is um, some rackets to consider some rackets. Um, we're not requiring, uh, if I understood the question correctly, but as far as USD membership or anything like that or um, specific to, to that, but it's mostly on the programming side for the organizations to offer an introductory program. And then our uh, availability of resources that we can help to make the program more successful locally. So we're looking at um, assistance in the funding aspect, as well as potentially some equipment that the participants would be able to receive as a result of joining that Tennis 101 program. I hope that answered your question, Michelle. Um, and then the other question in the Q&A, would USPTA membership will be uh, also acceptable? As far as grants are concerned, we don't require a USPTA membership, um, but you're welcome to add it into your narrative to say that that is um, one of the, I guess, caveats or uh, criteria that you want to uh, let the reviewers know that your coaches are USPTA or USPTR. Great. Is nonprofit, yeah, another one just popped up. Uh, Thanks, Gregory. Is nonprofit status required for all the grants? Not for all the grants, because there are some partners or organizations that may not be in the example of some school providers or partnerships, I should say. So in our school use initiative grants, there may be some opportunities for uh, clubs that are not not-for-profit to support initiatives in the school. So we, as I, as I noted earlier, we wanna be flexible because sometimes that's where, as we uh, learned from our school session this past week, the opportunity may lie, is that some of these clubs within these local areas of our section are able to offer tennis in the schools. And then the grant would be applied from uh, that organization that may be a club. And that is an example from the schools perspective. Um, however, I do want to say, if in fact you check the box in the application that says whether or not you're a not-for-profit or non-profit, you must provide information that you are. So your EIN has to be intact. Um, we do a um, guide star check uh, that indicates uh, whether or not your nonprofit status is current. So if you are, again, writing that in your grant that you are, uh, that has to be prove, proven. Hope that answers that question, Gregory. There's another question that just popped up around grant requirements. Can you repeat the Safe Play approval information and does everyone involved in the program need to be Safe Play uh, approved? That's administrators and all the pros. Hi, Joni Akpan. This is <laughs> nice to nice to have you on this call. Um, yes, that is correct. Uh, in terms of the safe play approval, it is a requirement, and I'll edit that in a bit to say that the person applying for the grant we want to be safe play. So the applicant herself or himself should be safe play, and in your grant narrative. Um, such as with, with Valerie, um, some of those tennis pros are listed in the narrative and next to their names say that they're safe play approved. So we do want to be very um, careful um, and really take this precaution seriously um, and do our due diligence as an organization to make sure those specifically who are working with uh, young uh, players or juniors um, even though if your grant may specify uh, just adults, we still want the safe play for the applicant. Hope that clears that up. You can always email me to discuss it further if you feel like uh, that wasn't clear enough. So I, I thanks Jocelyn. I think that, um, you know, I know we're winding down on the hour and we have, we have a, a full audience. A lot of people are on, I um, want to ask Valerie and Dennis, there a lot of people are very new to the grant process and you guys have had some experience. If you were, you know, maybe just one piece of advice that you can offer 
to folks that are getting started that you wish you, someone told you, you know, before you started, you know, trying to raise money for, for these projects? So just one piece of advice, just, you know, if you guys can share one minute each. Thank you. Oh, okay, so um, I think one piece of advice um, is what Jocelyn touched on before um, with the rules, just do, just write what they're asking for. Don't add any extra things. Um, just, you know, make sure that what you're applying for is actually what they're giving the money out for. That's basically it. That's, that's really helpful. As a, as a grant maker, I, I do appreciate when people are responding to the questions that are posed. <laughs> Yeah, so Dennis, what is your one piece of advice for our audience members? I'll preface this by saying, do as I say, not as I do. Uh, try to get <laughs> things in on time. Uh, <laughs> meet those deadlines, um, you know, especially if, if you end up making a mistake and you need to revisit, um, you, you definitely, um, you want to take, you want to take your time with it. Um, I would also add, you know, just um, try to try to identify your pathway what works for you and, and where you are and, and what you can do realistically. Um, because one of the benefits that I think we're finding it, it, with our NJTLC is that um, we're operating a little bit better because our focus has, has really narrowed. Um, and so we're, we're really trying to focus on um, creating these cohorts to, to build towards competition. So this, two of our orange ball cohorts, for example, will be competing for the first time. Um, so that's exciting, you know? So again, you have to, you have to really have a plan and, and, and a goal uh, in mind with your, with your program and, and consider the pathway that's gonna work best for you. And then look at the grants that really meet, you know, meet that pathway uh, and can support that pathway. And, and, um, and then it'd be easier to certainly write that uh, in your grant request. Great advice, and I, I, you know, just to kind of piggyback on what you guys said, the, the being able to know what you need resources for is important rather than looking, seeing an a grant opportunity and trying to respond to that and say, well, I, you have money available, let me make a program. But it, it, it's, you should have the program or pro at least the program idea before you're trying to find funding for it. So I think that's tremendous advice. Um, there was another question in the chat. Um, but it, it popped up and popped away. So I don't know if you saw that, Jocelyn, if that was a question you answered or not. I um, did. I, I had, um, I had uh, them directly uh, reach out to me via email. It's a, it's a longer uh, question to answer for this uh, session, but I do appreciate the question. Uh, some other, uh, and um, I will uh, not notice another question in the chat, which is, uh, from Adrian, is it a requirement for grant programs to use the Serve Tennis platform? It is not a requirement. Um, we don't, and, and I'm going to put this in a way that's, you know, empathetic and sympathetic. We're in a difficult time of our, of our lives, not just in the tennis world. So, um, but for us, circling back to what, what's important and uh, for our tennis industry, we don't want to put too many barriers up. Uh, Serve Tennis is a, an exciting new platform that's coming through, um, but to offer that as a requirement right now um, is, is not an appropriate time, but um, we'll definitely look into it. <laughs> You'll probably notice uh, this time next year, we'll, we'll say, hey, here's another requirement. But uh, for now, no, it is not a requirement for the grant. Thank you for that question as well. I think we are about winding down, aren't we, Danielle? Um, yes, yeah, this has been a great conversation and I really just wanna thank you and thank Eastern, you know, for hosting this conference and thank, thank our, our guest panelists, Valerie and Dennis, you guys are amazing. The information that you shared, I think it's gonna be very helpful for the audience, just the, the thoughtfulness of what you, your, how you approach this process. It's very helpful, so thank you so much. I um, agree. I'm gonna turn it yeah. back over to you, Jocelyn. <laughs> I agree, and and you said it. I mean, it's it's about the conversations. It's about the time. This this conference, we're always about networking, and to hear from Valerie and Dennis and Danielle with your expertise and and your background, and also being a part of the session, it truly helps. 
Um, so in conclusion, I think it was great, some key points that Valerie and Dennis shared as grant writers and experience in, in their programs in the community, um, plan and have a goal in mind, as they said. Um, and it's uh, important to identify that. Take your time, don't be anxious about it too, just a little tip as well. Um, we're here to support you guys. And um, so if you have any questions, always reach out to our staff. Um, obviously too, uh, nothing's that easy as well. So um, it is a process. Uh, just because you submit something does not mean that you will get it. <laughs> uh, so work through, work through those challenges as well. Uh, from the programming side, Valerie and, and Dennis talked about having pros and instructors and the challenges of trying to run a program. Uh, and I'm sure that many members of, of the audience who's attending the session also share in the same experiences. So this was very valuable. So I, I again, truly appreciate your time, uh, Valerie, Dennis, and thank you, Danielle. Um, before I close, I just wanna do another call out to the rest of our uh, Eastern Tennis Conference sessions that are happening uh, today. So again, at noon, there's a session there, which I think would, would touch upon some marketing efforts as well. Um, and then the five o'clock session and then our award ceremony. Um, fun times, hopefully you could make it, have a, a cocktail by your desk and computer and help us celebrate. Um, as well as celebrate Jenny's birthday today. So thanks. Thanks so much for joining us. Please enjoy the rest of the day. Stay warm and safe. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for thank all the you. birthday wishes. Happy birthday, Jenny.